you. Thanks all for being here today. Uh, our event is titled Crypto and National Security, the Future of U.S. Economic Security in the Crypto Age. On behalf of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School, I'm John Polson. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, for those unaware, NSI has been hosting a range of conversations over the last year between the crypto and national security communities around crypto's implications for U.S. leadership in tech and financial markets, for illicit finance and sanctions policy, for privacy and human rights at home and abroad, and other key national security objectives. On behalf of NSI, we are thrilled to host an amazing group of finance and national security experts to examine the intersection of the role of crypto in nation-state economic competition and U.S. economic security strategy. And with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's panel. Scott Cipollina is the digital assets correspondent at the Financial Times, where he authors Crypto Finance, FT's weekly newsletter released each Friday, highlighting the week's top stories in the world of crypto. Uh, Scott is based in London, England, and earned an MA in investigative journalism at City University of London. Welcome, Scott. Uh, before we get started, uh, a quick note on the Zoom. So to ask a question for our panel, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen and submit questions through that interface. And please feel free to submit questions throughout today's program uh, as they come to you. You do not need to wait until we actually begin the Q&A portion of the program, which will take place during the last 15 minutes of this event. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Scott. Thank you, John. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction and welcome everybody to the panel. I'm excited to get started. Before we dive into questions, I'd just like to introduce, of course, the panel. Uh, first, we've got Yaya Fanuzi, who is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Century. We have Jeffrey Okamoto, who is managing director at Goldman Sachs, and Julie Myers-Wood, who is a National Security Institute advisory board member, and she is also CEO of Guidepost Solutions. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining me. Really looking forward to the conversation. I think what we can do maybe to kick off right from the start is have a bit of a take a bit of a bird's eye view before we get into the crypto side of things. If you could all sort of give me a summary of what your views are as to what the role of the US dollar is in national security and what its relation is to the state of global currency corruption. Why don't we start, Yaya, with you? Oh, great. Okay. Um, could start with me. I thought uh, some of our, our banking <laughs> experts would be the ones to handle that. I mean, I, I'm going to defer to them, but I think from a national security perspective, I can emphasize really the focus on the ability to um, ap apply pressure, right, for financial coercion. In a nutshell, what you have is the U.S. has, you know, significant political power, geopolitical power, uh, because it controls access to the U.S. dollar, which also means uh, access to uh, banks. Uh, if banks want access to U.S. dollar, they're going to have to follow U.S. sanctions law, right? That's sort of the 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 uh, the key issue that I think most most folks are are thinking about. I mean, that's one dimension. So, I mean, I'll, I'll probably pass pass along the baton. I'm sure we'll get into the details, but I think throughout the conversation, we're going to be thinking about you know in the financial system. Who holds access? Who are the sort of gatekeepers to accessing global finance, global trade, and what institutions are important? What institutions do you need to access if you really want to transact globally on a mass scale? And right now, the U.S. Uh, financial system and U.S. banks are central to that. Good stuff. Um, thank you for that, Yaya. Um, Jeffrey, how about we pivot to you next then? Sure. Thank you. And uh, um I think it's a good place to start. I think so much um, when we talk talking about crypto and digital assets and the rest, you get down to um, security, not security, uh, features uh, and the rest. And fundamentally, we're talking about something here that is a uh, an instrument for transferring value, right? Uh, and that's what money is. And I think from a, you know, kind of coming from a background of a finance ministry or kind of central banking, right? Money is is something that the government cares a lot about. Um, and And I think, it, the more that technologists understand kind of what okay. the government's priorities are there is important, right? So one is macroeconomic management. You can, the other is managing your external competitiveness, how effective you are in uh, facilitating trade, for example, how the government needs to borrow, right? So there's huge economic security consequences as we're discussing now in the, in the context of the debt limit of, of the government being able to borrow and, and, um, and transact. Uh, borrowing in your own currency, right? Especially when you're the reserve currency issuer, it gives you enormous advantages. Um, uh, but then you get to the issues that um, 
Yaya and, and Julie and others are more experts in than I am, uh, you know, uh, the law enforcement side of it, right? Who gets to use the money and under what conditions, right? Uh, and what uh, data and analytics come from that that can help law enforcement do their job. They're a big law enforcement and national security, foreign policy, economic statecraft kind of uh, things that, that attach to that that I, I think are, um, are, are quite relevant. And I think the more we think about those things, the things that money gives the government the power to do, helps you understand kind of how the government's going to view the evolution of, of uh, digital money, right, um, in its uh, uh, kind of economic or national security architecture. Yeah, I think those are some very uh, good points. I'm sure we'll dive into the, the details of them in the in the next hour or so. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, Julie, why don't we round off that first question with you? I think you may be on mute, on mute Julie. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I agree no very way. much with what with what's been said, and I think the fact that the dollar is a, um, the reserve currency really gives the U.S. tremendous power and power that's often needed at a broader level for the U.S. to help resolve things and to weigh in effectively. Um, I went to school at Cornell where they had Ithaca dollars, and you know, a ban on Ithaca dollars would not affect your ability to do business, even in Ithaca, right? But a ban on U.S. dollars or being to transact in U.S. dollars dollars affects many, many people outside of U.S. persons. And so I think that's why it's really been so critically important and why the U.S. has really used sanctions as a tool, uh, not often as nuanced a tool as we'd like. <laughs> Sometimes a very broad, a very broad tool, but often I think an effective tool. And it's been you know, really important in our history and something the U.S. has relied upon. Absolutely. Um, thank you all for, for kicking off the the discussion so well there. If we may pivot um, to crypto, uh, another question I'd like to ask, fairly generic again, and you know, take it where, where you'd like. Um, you know, we hear often in the crypto industry about you know widespread adoption. Um, that's been to a degree perhaps undermined over the last twelve months. With you know, this you know, seeing what the digital assets industry has gone through writ large. But what would mainstream adoption and the resulting regulation that would come out of that mainstream adoption do? when it comes to G7 nations or even G20 nations in terms of competing monetary policies, how would it undermine some of those positions? Um, let's circle back to Yaya. Well, that's a big open-ended question because it's all, it really depends on how that would be implemented and how that would be supervised. You know, sort of uh, crypto adoption by itself is not necessarily a threat to G7 nations or to the U.S. economy or, or, or economies of, of, of the major, the major economies. Um, you know, it really, I mean, there are lots of different visions for how crypto could be integrated perhaps into, you know, traditional financial markets. I mean, I think we're at a, we're at a place of finding and, and figuring out. I mean, right now there's a lot of momentum towards just making sure there's clarity and uh, around how crypto markets should be integrated. And you especially see this in in Europe with with, with MICA and, and 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 regulation there with the EU. I think in the U.S. again, it also depends which dimension of regulation you're talking about. People often say that there's not much regulation with crypto and there's a lot lack, lack there's lack of certainty. And again, it depends on what type of regulation. Um, I always point out, you know, you got to give the U.S. government credit where, where, where you can, right? Because I always point out that uh, the U.S. was actually ahead of the game in terms of uh, the anti-money laundering regulation of crypto markets. In the U.S. since 2013, there was a lot of clarity. Now, some of these other questions about securities, et cetera, there, you know, there's maybe there, there are more uncertainties. But um, I think the thing I would say is that one perspective is the jurisdictions that maybe quote unquote get it right you know if this is simply a technology that could be used for good for ill has a lot of potential functionality a lot of promise in that way then you know from that standpoint whoever um leverages it and harnesses it in the best way and mitigates the risk or the you know the illicit side um then there's really maybe net benefit uh, but if it's not handled and if it's not harnessed and leveraged in the right way, uh, if a lot of it just goes underground and there's not no rules, then um, you can have a lot of problems. So it depends on how it's managed. Sure, that's that's certainly very true. Um, Jeffrey, what are your views on on widespread crypto adoption and how that may impact the the G7 or even G20 environment? I think the conversation in the G7 and G20, if you were having it two years ago, right, um, was very focused on how big of a uh, how big of a market is this becoming, right? 
um, what are the links to the regulated financial sector that the government has backstops behind in terms of deposit insurance or uh, and, the, and a market that the government has an interest in and maintaining because it's the conduit for the execution of monetary policy uh, and the execution of their you know, trade finance and everything else. So that was kind of the conversation a couple of years ago. Since then, right, it's, it, as you pointed out, Scott, industry shifted quite a bit. It's uh, uh, contracted quite a bit and the systemic consequences of this have been pretty contained, right? Uh, and so I think the question, right, and so to, to, that, to, to, that, uh, to that point, right, what has transpired right over the past uh, uh, year or so, right, has really been seen by some governments, I think, as a way of, of being able to buy them time to figure out what the public sector response is, whether it's a regulatory framework, whether it's a CBDC, uh, whether it's stablecoin rules or the rest. And so this has been kind of a blessing for them in disguise, right? Uh, no, concept, no problems. Uh, with the um, the market contracting uh, and buying them time, right, for them to figure out what their what their answer is, and I think that is where uh, the system, right, right now is struggling because you have challenges for you know when you talk about even like minded countries that want to um, uh, cooperate on this, you have challenges that are technical, right, interoperability and technical features. You have challenges that are more policy related. How do how do I want to control capital flows, how do I want this to interact with the financial sector? How does my government uh, uh, you know, stand to benefit or lose in aspects of this? And then you have challenges that are polit political, right? These are privacy, right? Sanctions, um, things like that. And every country begins from a different place on all of those, right? Different types of financial sectors, different types of privacy regimes, even between the US and Europe, different types of uh, technical capabilities in some countries that have wholly underdeveloped financial sectors or wholly underdeveloped capital markets or banking systems. And so I think that is where this is gonna be a challenge uh, over the next couple of years. And so that buying of more time, right, for uh, the G7 plus or G10 plus countries um, is probably needed because <laughs> I think they, they need this time to, um, to sort out answers to some of these things. Sure. Um, Julie, I'm interested in your, your thoughts as well. What, what macro, international relations level sort of um, consequences may there be if, if crypto does um, achieve that widespread adoption that its advocates have 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 clamored on for for quite a while now well I I agree with what uh, what's been said but I think also really it's just the regulatory it's how broad is the regulatory scheme going to be in various countries so you could have widespread adoption but totally different regulatory schemes so that in practice it um uh, you could do a lot more activity or it could be a lot more limited. And that's what's going to make it hard for the private sector, hard for people to transact, hard for people to uh, companies to act in a law abiding manner. And if you look at how privacy has evolved, I think it's been it's been a real challenge. Everybody wants to put their own little stamp on things. And this we're seeing this again in crypto. And so just as traditional financial institutions looking at financial crime, you know, think about kind of a framework and a base framework rely on either the US or the EU to kind of start with, you're going to have to find the same sort of model, I think, in crypto, what's, you know, what's the country model that you're going to adopt and do that more broadly for your business operations in order to succeed. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very valid point. I'd like to go back um, to a point that you made, Julie, that has been made really across the panel um, about the you know effectively the kind of regulation that would be prompted by mainstream crypto adoption. And if if I may, we can perhaps focus a little bit on the states. Uh, and Yaya pointed out that you know the states has been perhaps ahead of the game when it comes to certain crypto risks, but perhaps not others. I think that um, if you look at what the Office of Foreign Assets Control, what the DOJ has done uh, more broadly. Um, has been to sort of regulate by enforcement. That's that's been a, a phrase that's been levied at the U.S. government when it comes to um, its approach to crypto. Do you think that's a fair assessment of of what's been the case? I mean, I suppose in terms of the SEC and the CFTC, there's still uh, a wrestling match for jurisdiction over this industry. Um, but in terms of enforcement cases, we've seen some some pretty significant ones come uh, across our desk just over the last few months alone. Uh, what coordination do you think perhaps is lacking in the states in terms of, you know, well, coordinating an effective national approach to crypto and what risks might arise if that coordination doesn't actually become more, more thorough and, more, and, and better understood in the years to come? Julie, why don't we, we stick with you for this one? 
Oh, absolutely. I think coordination is desperately needed. Uh, the private sector and innovators are looking for coordination, but if there's coordination in crypto, that'll be the first area that there's coordination in. And, you know, so U.S. law enforcement is really known for, frankly, grabbing on to jurisdiction and every little agency that has a piece of things looking for their role. And that's what we're seeing here in crypto. That's what we saw in traditional financial crime. That's what we've seen in trade controls. It's really, it's it's traditionally U.S. We also, of course, have the states. And so all the states, the money transmitted requirements, they're all a little bit different. Their audits are different. Uh, the New York uh, Department of Financial Services are all weighing in in a different way. Um, I think coordination as a whole is good for the industry, but you know who it's bad for? Sometimes it's it's bad for kind of honest people that want to do business uh, because sometimes coordination can um, uh, can make law enforcement less effective. You actually can be better when you're coming at it from many different angles, and so. Uh, while I wish there was coordination, and I think we thought there was great hope with Biden's, you know, digital asset, um, you know, push and and um, uh, uh, statement that there'd be coordination, I think knowing the U.S. government, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see it. And I think, frankly, it might be good in our efforts for crime that different agencies are pursuing things in different ways because they may have different successes. Um, I think about uh, OFAC, for example, um, you know, OFAC was really pushed ahead by the New York Department of Financial Services on some of the Iranian asset issues. They were not, OFAC was not really moving. They were really sitting. And so New York DFS was very aggressive with banks like BNP Paribas, and then OFAC became more aggressive. So sometimes a little friendly competition, lack of coordination, you know, that can uh, reduce the amount of crime, not encourage it. That's an interesting take. Uh, I see, Yaya, I saw you um, nodding your head during Julie's uh, response there. What are your thoughts on on the uh, you know perceived lack of coordination that's been levied across the U.S. government as it relates to crypto regulation? I won't say much. I think Julie really captured it. I mean, you know, maybe I'll just emphasize the point that flexibility flexibility is very very important, right? And especially in law enforcement, as she pointed out. And I think a lot of what the crypto community has been saying is, you know, first of all, there there can't be a one size fits all approach, right? I mean, that's the thing I think. And and you know, I think those of us we've been following crypto for so many years, I think you know, there's a learning curve that uh, regulators, legislators, law enforcement sort of have to go through, right? When they first look at this thing, it looks like this. You know, um, and then you have the the issue that you have all the you know all the all the all the blind men uh, holding the different parts of the elephant, saying what it is to them because hey, that's what they're touching, that's what they're dealing with. Um, so I think we're again we're in this learning curve or adoption curve on the other side where governments are really trying to figure out well what is the best approach. I actually think again, sort of as a watcher uh, of the industry, looking at understanding this technology for for the past several years, you know, I actually say there is. is a bit of a good story, right? Back in 2016, I remember when again, what 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 is Bitcoin? You know, and, and giving presentations and in front of audiences of again very educated people working in government and, and and getting questions like, so how do I hold the Bitcoin? You know, like what 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 is this? Is not understanding it, and I I'd say that despite the uncertainty and the the sort of you know the you know little little bit of political football that there is. There is much more understanding uh, in the policymaker community about about crypto, about how it works. So I'm I am actually uh, optimistic, even though there seem to be a lot of fissures between agencies. But I do think there will continue to be um, regulation by enforcement. They're just not going to get ahead of, of that. And so, you know, what the private sector needs to be doing is continuing to focus on these enforcement actions, looking at, you know, uh, statements that are made, frankly, in press releases or in settlements as guidance on what's going to be accepted, what's not going to be accepted, and how they need to change their compliance programs. Yeah, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about stable coins, but before I do, Jeffrey, uh, I'd like to pose the same question uh, to you before we move on. I mean, not much to add here. I mean, from the perspective of a highly regulated uh, financial institution, right, um, at, at federal and state levels, I think we try to look at this by disaggregating um, some of what I think is commonly kind of sucks a lot of the uh, energy out of the room, which is who should, which, who has jurisdiction and is this a security? And if so, uh, 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 what, what attaches to it? 
and really, um, from our perspective, the thing that we work on, which is much more how we apply blockchain and things that we already know are securities or know are not securities, <laughs> you know, and so, um, uh, and I think the thing that uh, we're looking for, right, is kind of to continue working with, with the regulators that we already have uh, looking after us, right, to find ways to innovate uh, on those types of applications. We think there's enormous promise there. And, and frankly, I mean, that, you know, that, 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 that Having a financial sector in the U.S. that can be more efficient, uh, be faster, right, uh, reach more people uh, at lower costs, that contributes something to economic security as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I think I'll stick with you for this next question, Jeffrey, because I, I think that you, you'll have some really interesting insights to kick us off. Um, there's been some reports shared uh, online about a potentially gold-backed stablecoin uh, that's being floated by Russia and and Iran. I'm interested to know what your thoughts are on, on this potential project, um, specifically what it might mean for the US going forward and also more broadly Western Western sanctions. Yeah, if you kind of look at the evolution of sanctions, which actually dates back to uh, a couple hundred years, <laughs> people think it started right after 9-11, but it was actually uh, the US inserting itself into a dispute between the between the England and France at the time. Um, you look at the evolution of this, right? Uh, it's only recently that we began to go after countries that have much larger and connected economies, both in terms of trade relationships, but also financial and capital markets uh, and more technological sophistication. So sanctioning a country like Russia is very different than sanctioning something like Cuba, right? Um, and, uh, 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 or, or Myanmar. Right. Um, or, I mean, like, you know, you can kind of go down the OFAC list and see uh, uh, the various sanctions programs that are in effect. And as you go after larger targets, right, larger, more connected, more sophisticated countries that have more resources, and they are, they are linked to other countries that are more dependent on them because they're more connected. The incentive, right, to develop alternatives to the existing architecture has also increased. Uh, so that, I think, is what gives rise to some of these experiments, whether it's old telex systems right, being set up in Russia to, to get around SWIFT, or it's a Russia-Iran gold-backed stablecoin, or what have you. But you can look at this in a variety of iterations. At the end of the day, though, right, I mean, the stabilizing forces around the dollar are, in my view, pretty strong, right? So people still want to invoice in dollars. They still want to remit payments generally in dollars against those uh, dollar invoices. They wanna raise capital in US markets in dollars, debt and equity. There's a legal framework for dollar contracts, right? Uh, there's the credibility of the Fed uh, and the stability of our currency. There's the sheer quantity, frankly, of dollar debt instruments that are available to invest your FX reserves in. And it's not close, it's not clear to me that those are close to being replaced necessarily by some of these things, but it's something we have to be sensitive to, especially as the G7, and others coordinate more or are signaling their desire to coordinate more to use sanctions as a statecraft, a tool of statecraft in more and more areas, right? Um, if Russia was a lesson in coordinating those tools in a way to achieve broader foreign policy objectives in a way that we haven't seen in the past, right? Uh, continuing to wield it in that manner uh, should, should just have us looking at and seeing what types of alternatives could become more, more, more concerning over time. And um, as well, you, you mentioned there, Jeffrey, uh, that Russia already have some um, already has some existing alternatives to, for example, the SWIFT system. Uh, Julie, maybe I will direct this next question to you. Just uh, in terms of the efficacy of a gold-backed stablecoin between Russia and Iran, um, I suppose it, the existence of these uh, these alternatives already begs the question. You know, why an additional alternative? I think the question from some skeptics would be, would a stablecoin be needed for Russia to evade Western sanctions? And if so, to what degree can it actually be useful? I think there are a lot of ways that um, uh, uh, Russia and, and um, sanctions parties seek to evade sanctions. I don't know that you need a new stable coin to do so. And in fact, I think that's kind of advertising <laughs> that, uh, that you're doing that versus using another method. Um, I think the points um, that Jeffrey made about the importance of the dollar and the dominance of the dollar continue. You could see if there was this kind of a stable coin that the U.S. would issue sanctions against any country or party accepting that stable coin. And so, you know, then it start to spiral, spiral down. 
but I think it's something that has to continue to be monitored and continue to focus. Um, we can't always count on the dollar being dominant, right? And uh, and so, you know, if other countries came up with this idea, not Russia and Iran, maybe it'd be more a more significant threat. And I think we do have to kind of pay attention and make sure that our financial system is in order and our house is in order and our country acts in appropriate ways to, um, you know, maintain the dominance of the dollar. Yeah, those are some um, interesting insights. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested to know what uh, your view is on a potential stablecoin between Russia and Iran. I mean, I, I think enough. A lot has been said on on that in particular, and I would echo those statements. I think what we're, what uh, everyone is pointing out is that there that this is maybe part of, or all, what I'll say is that the thing to watch is really this experimentation that's happening all around, right? Mm -hmm. And countries learn. Co countries are learning about what works and what may be a better approach to try to evade sanctions. You know, a few years ago, very quietly, Venezuela was probably the first to create its own cryptocurrency that the Maduro regime said was to evade sanctions and like like julie said boom it was sanctioned you know it was sanctioned right away so it, it didn't make a difference it didn't change their fundamentals but if i can i know we're probably because i think in the chat even the the china has come up right and, and obviously we're going to talk about china so i'll 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 um before we get into china if i can share um i think what what we have to be mindful of is you know when it comes to the us dollar it's not so much direct competition that you know is is an issue um you know um uh, displacing the dollar as a global reserve country a currency in the next year or two. That, that's not going to happen for an array of reasons. But let's take a page out of history, because I think sometimes we think about these shifts and we're only looking to like what happened after World War II, and that's kind of where we're starting. But I want to go back further. Um, I think about economic shifts from like the 15th century. And if you remember, think about one situation. Think about Portugal. Portugal was a small country uh, in the Iberian Peninsula that was looking to, for its economic goal, which was to get to the Orient. And to get there, it had to go, you know, through the Middle East, through Africa. And, 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 and you know, there was a, a, a Portuguese leader, Prince Henry the Navigator, who said, you know what? I wonder if instead of trying to go over land and go directly through those same trade routes to get to the Orient, you know, quote unquote, that's the term they used back then. He said, you know, he was into navigation. Why don't we innovate? Why don't we figure out, why don't we build off the technology that has been available for centuries and then try to create better seafaring? And they created a new route. And that sort of changed the landscape. It, changed, it opened up the age of exploration, made coastal cities more important. And what did you have? Portuguese became a huge power because of this technological innovation. The lesson there for me is that, you know, Know, what what is often important is you know an adversary figuring out or power figuring out hmm maybe we should play a different game maybe it shouldn't be just the you know playing the same game as our adversary and i think a lot of this experimentation is in the, that bucket that bucket of okay yeah, maybe we can figure out now they're going to be there's going to be experimentation. Some of it won't work. Some of these you know, some of these things will phase out. But as we sort of maybe start talking about China, what you see is maybe a more concerted effort or a more serious effort to use technology and to try to coordinate pilots uh, to get countries to experiment with alternative routes, alternative ch channels for payments. And that's what's happening. Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating point. Um, and I do want to jump into China. I think I'll, 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 I'll we'll, we'll jump on China next. But while we're on the subject of sanctions evasion, I think it would be interesting to uh, briefly discuss uh, Ukraine. And I think that this has become the sort of marquee issue when it comes to sanctions evasion through the broader technology of digital assets. So you've got advocates for crypto will say that folks have been able to donate to Ukraine's cause effectively and quickly and at times anonymously. Um, which is a good thing, uh, although on the other side of the debate, some folks will say that the existence of cryptocurrency has enabled some Russian actors to evade sanctions. So there's a there's two sides to the coin here, pardon the pun. But um, uh, Jeffrey, if we can start with you on this front. What are your views writ large on the crypto industry's general impact on bad actors and their ability to evade sanctions? I, mean, I think anytime there's a new technolo te uh, technological innovation, right, um, uh, that um, uh, isn't as subject to as much regulation, right, or if you want to call it, uh, or in, in the industry is is still maturing in, in its ability to detect and uh, root out and report um, kind of bad actors, it's going to be abused, right? So I think uh, so some amount of that, I think, um, uh, 
is going on and, um, and that's um, unfortunate and over time right I think as we harden the infrastructure around this and the endpoints as this gets into the kind of regulated financial system right uh, those in, entry and entry and exit points you can you can start to um, uh, you can start to, uh, to to lower the potential for that to be abused um, I mean that being said though right I mean I think again if you if you're thinking about the opportunity set here, for Ukraine, which is a country that's going to have to rebuild itself, right, uh, in the wake of all of this, um, and had uh, prior, right, uh, a prior history of, of a financial sector that was weaker than probably it should have been, right, um, uh, and was subject to some integrity issues of its own uh, over time, right. I mean, I, you can think about how you apply this technology in the wake of this to really build a robust, efficient uh, financial infrastructure. Um, in a country uh, that um, is capable of facilitating capital flows to proper investment, right? Capable of facilitating remittances from Ukrainian diaspora that are um, that want to see their their homeland rebuilt. And so, I think there are also opportunities here, as much as in the as much as there are kind of uh, uh, risks that we have to be aware of. Uh, yeah, very good points all around. Uh, Julie, what's your view generally on the? Um, the impact crypto has had as an industry on, on the sanctions evasion industry itself? On the sanctions evasion uh, industry itself, it, it's just another, it's another tool, right? It's, a, it's another way you don't have to carry, right? Carry your cash in the duffel bag like they did in the old HSBC days, right? Or you, you know, you don't uh, have to use Hawala. You could use, you can now use crypto. I think there are advantages for law enforcement because everything is kind of traceable and reviewable in a way that it's not always when you're kind of handing over cash. But it definitely is a challenge, and I think law enforcement historically was playing a bit of catch up. Right. It, so it took them a while. Um, and certainly I think the tools now there are a lot of good market tools um, that help uh, help with tracing, uh, you know, blockchain explorer, other things that really can um, ensure that law enforcement can be effective. But I think it's been a couple of years. And I think if you look at the FBI's just recent success with Hive, right, and getting money back uh, in ransomware, that was not happening. You know, pre-crypto, if you're giving if you're giving money in, in cash or some other way, you weren't necessarily getting it back. And so I think that there are there are actually are some advantages. Um, I think, like others have said, it's it's any tool can be used for good or for evil. I think with Ukraine, though, uh, it's been great given that things are disrupted. Traditional banking money flows could be disrupted. To have a way to get money there quickly um, is, I think, really important. Interesting. Um, yeah, if we can perhaps uh, round off that subject with you, and then I know that we're keen to jump into China, so. Perhaps I'll stick with you for the next question as well. I agree with everything everyone has said. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, in, in, yeah. in that case, yeah, then let's, um, let, why don't we just dive um, into China? I think that one adjacent issue to digital assets or to crypto, I should say, is uh, the existence of obviously CBDCs. Um, and one thing that jumps to my mind whenever I think of CBDCs is uh, Jerome Powell, who I think said a good couple of years ago now that it's more important to be right on this than to be first. Uh, of course, on the other side of the world, China is, you know, fairly far along on their CBDC project. So I'd like to put the question to you. Um, what are the what is the role of CBDCs as it captures U.S. China competition? Interesting question. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of dimensions to this, and I think I'll sort of take one particular tack on it. Um, in fact, I'll give a little preview because uh, back at the Center for New American Security, um, a, a colleague, Emily Jin, and I are working on a rep another report on China's digital currency that we hope will be out in, in a few weeks. So, so look out for that. And what we did with our, our latest research is we actually, um, you know, there's already the story about the surveillance, uh, the surveillance side of the CBDC. And we, we decided to explore a little bit further into the past year, there've been lots, over a hundred, you know, 100 plus pilots of China's CBD, CBDC called the ECNY. That's one of the, the, that's the popular term. And I think the way we're looking at this, if you want to think about the com competition angle, it, it, it may be through the lens of China is creating more functional money. Um, it's really creating more programmable money in ways that already do exist in different forms of payments, but has never really been implemented at scale in sort of national fiat money. And one of the things, so it's interesting. So a lot of what we're seeing with some of these uh, ECNY pilots 
are, are very rudimentary smart contracts. So one perfect example is um, like putting money and doing payments where you put money in escrow. So by, you know, basically to try to mitigate counterparty risk, you know, with suppliers or with certain services, you know, you pay the money and it goes into a smart contract wallet. And then when services are, are you know, are, are rendered, then it's released into the other person's, uh, into the person's account, right? And, and otherwise it goes back to the original buyer. And there are a lot of little things like that, which, which they're implementing broadly in these little pilots. Why is that significant? It's significant because this is sort of an approach to make more programmable functional money, which has it definitely has its downsides, right? Could be used to cut people out by the state, by the central bank or whatever. Um, but also they're experimenting to try to come to make money more functional. And I'll maybe just, you know, there's so much we can talk about China. I'll, I'll just sort of drop that there that if the United States, whether it does a CBDC or not, you know, you know, doesn't consider that money is changing, that there are other functions and other formats of, of money, and that a country like China is really forward leaning and trying to push the limits and is looking for more innovation and more data capture. So there's like a whole sort of strategic play that's happening with China's CBDC. And if we just see it as oh, well, is it going to compete with a dollar in foreign exchange markets? Like, no, that's not even, that's not the issue. Again, see, see the, the shift over centuries, right? When people try to innovate in order to find an alternative, something, some alternative uh, value. Yeah, no, those are some really interesting points that you've made there. And I think, you know, the, the point that you make about scale in particular is something that perhaps is, is, is often overlooked when people discuss China's CBDC. Uh, Jeffrey, what are your thoughts on on you know China's progress on that front and how it may impact the states going forward? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's you're kind of going back to what I said maybe at the top. Everybody starts from a different structure of their financial sector and their society and their markets and the rest, right? And I think um, uh, what has allowed China right to make substantial progress, right, is the fact that you know some of the largest banks, which are the wallet providers or state-owned banks. So there's the coordination of industry and government and policy uh, uh, enabled them to move faster. Um, they also arguably have less at stake, right? So for the, to, to Jerome Powell's point, um, to be right or uh, to be first, um, we have to get it right because uh, there are dozens of countries around the world that use the dollar as their <laughs> de facto or official uh, currency, de jure currency. Um, uh, we have uh, the large deep capital markets that China itself uses to issue it, right? Um, so the stakes for us to get this right, uh, and not just right in terms of a technological architecture, but right in terms of an economic architecture um, is, uh, is much more important. It, the stakes are just so much higher for the US. I mean, you can think of a scenario where, um, I mean, here we are on the eve of a, uh, of a potential rate hike by the Federal Reserve a rate hike that gets transmitted into the economy through a combination of capital markets uh, and banks, right? Um, and uh, and if you change the architecture for that, that fundamentally shifts, right? How people and firms interact with, you know, kind of financial intermediaries in the in the system, uh, your ability to influence the macroeconomic environment could fundamentally change. And so, if you don't know how to do that, right, um, you could actually start messing things up pretty easily. So I think that so taking it in, into Yaya's point. The risk of, you know, um, my mother using the ECMY uh, in California is not high, right? Um, uh, if it's rolled out, right? I mean, her, uh, her, her, you know, that's just not something that, uh, you know, <laughs> she'd be <laughs> interested in doing. I think there is interesting aspects to this in terms of other parts of Chinese foreign policy, in terms of uh, whether this gets extended to places that don't have. Uh, other options, right? But in terms of uh, of competition in the U.S. market, I think that that is quite limited. Thanks for those um, points, Jeffrey. Uh, Julie, why don't we round off this subject with you before we uh, uh, pivot, perhaps to audiences' questions? I'll remind uh, the audience that you can ask some questions, and we'll pick them up in a few minutes. Sure. I think Yaya and Jeffrey really hit on, I think, some of the key points. The only other thing I would add is I think the important role for Congress to play and really pushing uh, you know, pushing the U.S. government to look at this seriously. I, I agree that we it's more important to be right than to be first, but we also should not be last. And I think that would have a negative uh, detrimental effect on our national security and um, 
I, I think we should really be thinking about uh, what's going on and making sure it's being evaluated. And I think Congress really needs to step up its role here to kind of push the executive branch on this. Um, no, I think that's, that's a very good point. And if I may start the Q&A session slightly early, because there's a question that um, rolls off the tongue, so to speak, with, with what you've just mentioned there, Julie. Uh, and this question comes from Jefferson Barry, who is asking if U.S. leadership is actually diminishing with China's uh, perceived rise in this digital asset space more broadly. Uh, perhaps we'll stick with you, Julie, for this question, and then we'll pivot to the rest of the panel. I mean, I'd be interested in the perspective of others. I don't think the U.S. Uh, leadership is diminishing at this point, but I think there are many entities that are looking for alternatives. I think there are countries that are poor <laughs> that are looking for, for other things. And so I think the opportunity is there for the U.S.'s uh, leadership to diminish if we don't kind of really uh, keep, uh, you know, keep keep the stake, keep, keep moving hard and keep thinking hard and keep thinking also in a way that is industry friendly. Uh, consumer friendly and is not kind of irrational. So, I, 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 you know, right now I think we're okay, but I think it's something that has to be watched. But I'd be very interested in Yaya and Jeffrey's uh, take on that. Yeah, um, same. Yaya, why don't we go to you next? Um, perhaps, you know, perhaps I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but is there a specific time frame that you can maybe share with us where you think, you know, this is where there is a tipping point where U.S. leadership would be at risk and when would we maybe hit that point? Yeah, there's no, I don't, well, I, I can't pr pr you know, pr predict or pr project that. I mean, I think that the thing, you know, I'm used to, you know, sort of as an analyst coming from the Intel world, right? I mean, what you want to do is you want to identify maybe indicators of change. What are some of the things that you would see for some sort of far off situation or even a black swan or, you know, low probability, you might think situation. What are the things that you would see? So the dollar being e eclipsed by, let's say, a CBDC would be one of those things. And you would probably see a lot of experimentation experimentation and investment. You would see a lot of trials, standard making by other countries. You would probably see that this is not, this would not just be an adversary to the U.S. figuring, uh, trying to do this, like Julie said, right? This is uh, a CBDC and an alternative system is something that's aspired to by friend and foe of the U.S., right? The U.K. had been, you know, considering it in, in, in some form. Um, and other, many other countries are, are not necessarily happy with having to depend on the U.S. dollar. So, um, I think that, you know, you, while we can't, while we might not say, oh, yeah, short term, it's not an issue, but I, there, there's definitely, there should be no sense of, of um, you know, uh, being impervious or, or that in perpetuity, in perpetuity that uh, the U.S. is going to have this position. Um, I won't say that sharks are in the water and they're smelling blood. I, I, it's not that situation, but it is a situation where you could imagine maybe a political shift, so, you know, there, there are a lot of things that could happen, right, that are unforeseen. War, lots of other things that could um, that could maybe spark a, a change. So that's why all of these little things, even though they're not going to, you know, they're not going to displace the U.S. right away, have to be paid attention to. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey, what, what about your thoughts on the same subject? Yeah, I mean, not, like, nothing's for granted, right? So just because you're... Um, the U.S. enjoys this position today, both in terms of the size and, and strength of its economy and um, the status that its currency has in the world uh, is, is the result of a series of choices, right? So, um, uh, and the ability to uh, continue to enjoy that position also is a result of choices, right? And, uh, and those choices get more complicated when, the, when people are demanding more features from the money, right? So, um, and so to Yaya's point, I, I can't pinpoint where on the timeline uh, that that starts to invert, right? But you can see a scenario, right? Um, that if you have uh, old tech money in the US uh, and the financial sector itself, right? Can't apply blockchain in the same types of meaningful ways that it can in other places. And so loses out on the efficiency and the reach and is not longer price competitive, and we're settling in, in, you know, on timelines that are much longer right, than other jurisdictions, you can see how over time this becomes a competitive disadvantage. And these are currently the things that give us the competitive advantage uh, for um, uh, you know, kind of mutually reinforcing uh, the dollar's role in the world, whether it's digital or old tech. And so I think as much as this is about trying to get the features of the money right, um, 
uh, you know, we do have to monitor kind of the pace of where our <laughs> where our competitors are too, because this is a relevant factor. It is a competition. Um, I'd like to actually. There's an interesting question that's come in to the uh, call from Aaron Ariaga, who asked. I mean, a lot of the focus of this conversation has been uh, foreign policy challenges and international security uh, risk, and maybe we can pivot slightly um, with this question from Aaron, who asks. Uh, what potential does cryptocurrency have in allowing external powers or groups financing illicit activity within the US? Um, Julie, why don't we kick this question off with you? I, I mean, there's there's a lot of potential, right? We definitely have seen that that criminals have moved to uh, using crim uh, crypto for their uh, for their illicit activities. And so it's just as any tool opens up and that's part of why, you know, the US, right, banned Tornado and it doesn't like some of the privacy coins and those things because there's a concern. Uh, mixers, you know, that, that certain things are used more often for harm than for good, right? Uh, so definitely that uh, there is a lot of illicit activity in the US that is uh, in, in crypto, there's a lot that's not, right? And, and so sometimes uh, what we see when we're investigating things or using chain analysis or elliptic is that people are not very smart. And so when I was in the US Attorney's Office, we used to say if the criminals weren't done, we wouldn't catch them, right? So there are a lot of people up on the blockchain that are not very smart. And so, you know, the, the FBI and others can track them, but absolutely, it's this is not just an international problem. It's a problem uh, right here and people are, you know, being taken. Um, for, you know, for all kinds of assets. Every day at Guidepost, we get emails from people saying they've been taken, they've been a victim of a scam and, and you know, trying to get their, their money back. So it's, it's definitely a domestic problem as well as a problem internationally. Yeah, I think that's a perfectly valid point to make. Uh, Yaya, do you have anything to add? I mean, the only thing I, I would add to that is, again, looking at the, you know, looking at this over time. And one thing I will say is, you know, the, you, you, Julie mentioned all the different blockchain analysis tools that are out there. And, you know, interestingly, I mean, the, the government, U.S. law enforcement is getting very good. I mean, getting very skilled, doing more training, building more analytic centers. Um, I mean, this is a high priority issue, again, compared to five, six years ago when it was very niche. So, you know, insight into criminal activity on the blockchain is 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 really is really growing it's maybe it's a growth industry but i think the preparedness uh, that the government has has actually uh, increased and one of the things I would just add is that the government is really looking for um, industry to step up if they are a victim of ransomware, a ransomware attack or something else. You know, they're looking for more partnership and they think they can do more to help. And the FBI just took down, you know, Hive, found the encryption keys, got, you know, people, a bunch of people's their money back. And that's something they weren't doing in the past. And they want to show that they're, you know, they're more on the side of industry and helping you know, helping you. And so I think that is something to think about, you know, do you reach out to law enforcement if if you have this kind of a problem? Yeah, um, before we move on to the next question, uh, Jeffrey, I'd like to know if you have perhaps anything to add to the subject. Uh, nothing to add on this one. Fair. Well, um, covered by the other, the two ex people who are more experts on this than me. <laughs> agreed, agreed, that was um, a thorough conversation on that subject. If, if, if I may ask, uh, I think this would be of, of benefit to the audience generally as well. Um, one part of the world that we haven't discussed really at, at any point in this panel is North Korea. Uh, it's often been made the case that North Korea is economically quite significantly reliant on crypto um, and that their illicit crypto industry has gone to some length of financing its illicit um, missile programs. I think, you know, in the eyes of some, this is the single most significant uh, national security threat facing the United States that is linked to the crypto industry. And I, I wonder if anybody has any any particular thoughts on that subject? Uh, Jeffrey, why don't we start with you if you have any thoughts on that? I, mean, I think this is the latest in a long chain of essentially criminal state behavior by North Korea, right? Who has long financed uh, its regime through, you know, one criminal enterprise or another over many decades. So um, uh, it doesn't surprise me that they are now using kind of the weaknesses uh, in this architecture to, um, uh, to make profit. And, um, uh, you know, I think, again, uh, be, so much of this, I think, from a, from a policy consideration, right, needs to be looked at in terms of, um, yes, the advantages and disadvantages of certain coins and uh, instruments and regulations and the rest. But I think some of this fundamentally is also about how much of this 
is a debate about what is centralized and decentralized. Um, and, um, and by the way, there are advantages and disadvantages to both, right? And there may be better applications for some in the centralized versus decentralized and vice versa. Um, but this is a this is a situation where a decentralized network right um, uh, leaves open right the possibility for somebody to abuse it because there is no central enforcement um, and uh, uh, and so we have to think about that more broadly on that particular subject. I think we you know I think a lot of advocates think decentralized um, kind of is the superior option and I I guess maybe I'll just ask people I mean the North Korea example being one aspect of it right but. Uh, to really think about your conviction there, because so much of how normal people use money, <laughs> right, um, is that they actually kind of like some amount of friction in the system, right? They like the ability that if I enter in the wrong bank routing number, I can get my money back, or that if somebody steals my uh, credentials or my card, I can, I, you know, it's covered by some anti, you know, fraud reimbursement measure, right? Um, and so I think the balance, right, of central and decentralized, whether it's in a security aspect or in a usability aspect, is one that I think this kind of forces. But, but I think that's a false sense of security sometimes. If you look at the, the issues with, with Zelle, with, <laughs> with the ATM cards, I think people think I'm using more, more traditional methods. And so my money is safe, I'll get it back and I won't necessarily. But I mean, I think you raise excellent points, but I think sometimes there is a sense of security that's maybe not properly founded. Yeah, and and this is sort of an it, there's an ongoing thing here, right? Because you know maybe maybe this tension that we're seeing in like the technolo technological adoption and advancement uh, and the gap between sort of um, everyday people. I mean, actually, funny uh, Jeffrey, I also have a mother in California. My mom is also in California, right? She's not going to get on a you know crypto or or DeFi platform, right? She's she's just not going to do it. Uh, she's going to stick to what what she knows. But um, you know, I just had a thought when. Both of you were speaking, which is, you know, you know, maybe though this tension is is you know, North Korea is not North Korea using crypto is not a good thing, right? But what happens though is that bad actors adopt; they have their own adoption curve. And what tends to happen is like, you know, there's this new innovation. Let's say it's DeFi. There's something that maybe it's outside the you know uh, regulations don't really apply, and then it gets adopted, and then there's more attention to it. Now, what tends to happen with regulators is they sort of then sort of behind the curve, they're thinking, wow, well, how do we deal with this? And it takes my my sort of mantra is, you know, regulators tend to be you know at least 18 months behind where the innovation is, right? Right? When you know, eight, and I think that's maybe being very uh, uh, optimistic or you know, liberal, right? They're usually you know a year or two behind. But what, where we are now with things like what happened with Tornado Cash, I think regulators are now really trying to figure out, okay, this stuff is here. These type of platforms exist. We do need to figure out how we're going to address them. And many people are saying, well, you can't use the same AML framework, regulatory framework, as that we had. So you know what it means? It means smart people have to really start thinking through like, is there a way, how do we approach this? And there are gonna be lots of proposals. Hey, BIS has thrown out some stuff. Other, other international agencies are thinking about this and in the US. You know, and you know, within 18 months, two years, we probably will have some a semblance of a framework to deal with some of these platforms. Now, the thing is, another 18 months, especially with crypto, <laughs> things will still innovate, so we'll be behind, but, but you know, that's, uh, that's the game. Yeah, that's a very, very good observation. Um, Yaya, thank you, everybody, for those really useful insights. We have just over five minutes left. So uh, perhaps I'll invite the panel to make some closing uh, summarizing statements. And I'll also leave you with a final question from an anonymous attendee to this call, um, who is asking, what is currently stopping the US from creating their own stable coin? And if they were to do so at any point, um, what political um, and security concerns might arise from such a undertaking. Um, Yaya, why don't we stick with you and then we'll go down to the rest of the panel. Yeah, um, a lot of the things which were referenced in terms of, you know, how much there is to lose, the, the financial stability, uh, you know, that that's just one one thing. It wouldn't be a simple thing for the U.S. to create its own either CBDC or its own stable coin, uh, even sort of how to address stable coin regulation as, as it is, right? That's a huge, complicated undertaking that that the U.S. government is is actually thinking about. So very, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Jeffrey, why don't we pivot to you next? 
yeah, maybe I'll, I'll end where I started, which is in the government's view of what money is, right? In terms of what it needs to serve for, for policy purposes is um, I don't think very well understood. And so, um, and, this is, and this is to your question on stable coins, right? It gets exactly to this. Uh, can the government borrow in its stable coin, right? Uh, can the government, I mean, will that work? Uh, will the government be able to f make sure that there's the proper amount of um, critical imports that can get financed? Will enough of those trading partners trust it? Will Goldman Sachs conduct uh, repo uh, using that as a medium, right? I mean, so you think about kind of the, the things that the government cares about, right? Um, are very different than I think what technologists are, are kind of thinking about. And I, by the way, I studied computer science at one point, I thought I was a technologist. It turns out I was a very bad programmer. Uh, but but I think there's a there's a way to think through these things from the prerogative of the government. Like, or what what are they what are they uh, caring about? Um, and I think the more we kind of ask that question, or at least have it in the back of our mind first, as we think through whether it's a policy consideration or a feature or a new product or service offering, if you're an entrepreneur, um, you're less likely to run into issues, right? Um, and uh, uh, and I think the good news is, right, is the government is slowly elucidating more and more of these types of priorities, which is different than we were five years ago. It was very focused on compliance um, years ago, and now it actually is moving to this uh, kind of like, you know, the, the, the darker or the deeper kind of considerations that um, the government cares about. So you, you actually have more information now to inform that view than you ever had. That's the good news. Thanks That's for very good. It's a very good point as well that um, I think that broadly speaking, uh, politicians and technologists perhaps are, are not thinking along the same lines generally. And that's an interesting observation. Uh, Julie, you have the opportunity to make the closing closing statement of the panel. <laughs> well, well, since this is NSI, and since I know that there are a number of law students on uh, on the call, as well as uh, perhaps folks from the Hill, I just want to encourage encourage you to think about government service, either on the Hill or inside the government. As you can see from what Yaya and Jeffrey and Scott have said, it's a really exciting time. There are a lot of things that are up in the air. And you know we need folks that are really interested and smart and creative to come into the government and help wrestle through these issues and think through these issues. So it can be the right kinds of regulatory framework that promotes innovation, but it's also compliant. So I just, that's my pitch, uh, pitch for today. Good stuff. Um, thanks everyone again for a really engaging panel and thank you to the audience for tuning in and asking some really thoughtful questions. Sorry that we didn't have time, of course, to get to all of them. Uh, with that, I will pivot back to John and thanks again to everybody for attending the panel. Well, thank you so much, uh, Scott Cipollina, for moderating today's panel. Uh, thank you to our amazing guests, Yaya Fanusi, Jeffrey Accomolo, Julie Myers-Wood, uh, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you also to our audience for asking some great questions uh, and helping out with today's discussion. Uh, just quickly, a few programming notes on behalf of NSI. Uh, we have a great event coming up next week on Tuesday, February 7th. Uh, we're going to be hosting a special happy hour reception for female congressional staffers who work on national security and foreign policy issues. Uh, for further details on timing and location for that, please visit the events page on our website. That's www.nationalsecurity.gmu.edu. Uh, in addition to that, we're also going to be kicking off our global repression programming for 2023. Uh, next month in February, in our first event, we will examine ongoing collaborations between oppressive regimes and highlight how this common alignment is a threat to U.S. national security and that of our partners and allies. More details on that will be available soon on our website. And finally, please do not forget to check out our flagship podcast, Fault Lines, where Jamil Jaffer, Jessica Jones, and Les Munson get you quickly up to speed three times a week on the national security and foreign policy debates shaking up America. Thank you again to our wonderful panelists. I'm John Polson. Have a great day. <laughs>